ఇప్పుడు థ్యాంక్ యూ హలో గుడ్ మార్నింగ్ గుడ్ ఆఫ్టర్నూన్ గుడ్ ఈవినింగ్ వై ఎవర్ యు ట్యూన్ ఇన్ ఫ్రమ్ వెల్కమ్ టు అనదర్ ఎడిషన్ ఆఫ్ లాటుకెన్ విసి టీవీ where we deal with issues trends that are affecting us and affecting our society um my name is Nathaniel Amida um i represent Latoken Nigeria and today with me we have a panel of beautiful people that will be discussing today's topic um to the stars and beyond investing in deep space and tech space um i'm sorry in, investing in deep tech and space tech so um there's a lot to be learned today during today's um, show and um obviously our audience are experts and um, well informed in this field i'd welcome everyone to join and participate in today's show and you can do that easily by making comments or posting questions on all our platforms that are streaming live on youtube on linkedin on twitter and then on facebook um men tag your friends tag your uh, partners um, make comments make posts and also there's an opportunity for entrepreneurs and startups that are also in whatever field whatever industry to pitch their projects to a panel just like this and if you get in touch with me or the latoken team will be able to um pick a day for you to make such a pitch and get the exposure and the funding you probably are looking for so today um very unusual topic not too popular we'll be talking about um space tech and um and all the in the 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 stuff around space tech now global private investment in space tech has risen between the year 2015 and 2018 to reach almost 18 billion now as of 2018 that's 18 billion that's a lot of money but today um our audience our panelists are here to answer the critical questions for us what exactly is space tech what exactly is deep tech and why is it relevant to humankind now now and in the future and um with me discussing today's um, relevant topic um i like to start from vandana vandana please um, let the audience know you let them um, know your background know a little bit about you yeah uh, thank you nathan for having me here on vc tv um uh, i am always glad to be here it's a, a kind of therapy session for me and uh, nice to meet kartik and harsh and gary as always uh, so uh, coming to my background i was in singapore and jakarta for 15 years in investment banking i had my own family office fund there uh, this is my sixth year back in india i did some investments and then i went back to advisory currently i am connected with 200 investors globally that includes pe's vcs angels and hnis Uh, we do pick up global deals we are sector agnostic our ticket size is 1 million dollars to 25 million dollars and looking forward for a fruitful conversation on this topic awesome thank you very much vandani and uh, the next um, kartik please give us a brief intro about yourself let the audience know who you are and your background thank you thank you so much nathan this is my 79th uh, appearance on your tv show and i quite like it it's it's been almost been year now and uh, i enjoy coming in here and meet people insight mining sessions as i call them are are fabulous for me to interact and learn new things i represent a couple of family offices uh, based out of the uk i represent a venture fund based out of saudi and qatar and uh, i represent a couple of uh, pe firms where i help them in identifying and getting the right pitches done so as to make sure the investments is segmented well i have investments in uh, fintech and health tech space and edutech and uh, obviously i am a space enthusiast that's why i'm here thank you so much awesome awesome thank you very much kartik look forward to hear your insights and all um harsh all the way from india <coughs> please Hi. tell the audience about uh, yourself man hey nathan uh, glad to be back to see from your faces in kartik and vandana as always and uh, yesterday i actually had two sessions with gary as well so really glad to be back on a regular basis 
So a short bio about myself. I'm a founder of a Facebook group called Startup Hackers. Uh, in less than two months, we've grown to 500 startup founders over there, trying to help all these stage startup founders during the early stages of their journey, and trying to grow their business, etc. What pitfalls they need to look at, what they need to avoid, etc. But at the same time, uh, additionally, I'm also a venture partner with Our Ventures, where we help startups raise funds all the way up to 10 million dollars. And uh, I do a lot of uh, deals apart from Our Ventures as well in a personal capacity. I'm currently working on a couple, uh, primarily in the cryptocurrency and health uh, healthcare space. And I actually had received an interesting proposition from a space tech company not so long back. So hoping for a great discussion today with Karthik and Vandana on the same. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much, Harsh. And I can see um, our viewers, the audience, are getting in on the action, already posting comments and appreciations. And I like to say it. Um, guys, keep the comments coming. Keep the questions coming. Let's have a great conversation today. Um, so um, while I've given a brief intro about um, what deep tech and space tech is about, the honest truth is that I do not know as much as um, you guys. So Vandana, I want to ask you a question. What exactly is deep tech? What exactly is space tech? I mean, we have fintech, um, ed tech, um, health tech, you know, agro tech. So what is deep tech? And give us a bit about space tech too. Sure, sure. Uh, so deep tech or deep technology refers to those startups whose business model is based on high tech innovation in engineering or significant scientific advances. For deep tech, the business starts with, with and circles around some sort of real innovative technology. Uh, it's deployed to solve almost intractable problems in the real world. Deep tech startups are likely to be based on artificial intelligence or machine learning or other innovative applications to new or existing emerging technologies like blockchain, computer imaging, and VR. Examples of deep tech might include AI applied to predict natural disasters or molecular imaging technologies that identify disease or predisposition to disease far before any other existing test possible could. The main areas deep tech startups are working are in artificial intelligence, life sciences, agriculture, aerospace, chemistry, uh, um, and clean energy. Uh, it's rare for deep tech to sit in one sector alone. By nature, it's a game changer. So we might see aerospace technologies used to monitor uh, crop conditions or an AI advance applied uh, to the production of clean energy or monitoring of a patient. Space technology is a technology that is related to uh, entering and retrieving objects or life forms from space. Everyday technologies such as weather forecasting, remote sensing, uh, GPS systems, satellite television, and some long distance communication systems critically rely on space infrastructure. Of sciences, astronomy, and earth sciences mostly uh, notably benefit from space technology. Space is uh, such an alien environment that attempting to work in it requires new techniques and knowledge. New technologies originating with or accelerated by space-related endeavors are often subsequently exploited in other economic activities. This has been widely pointed to as beneficial by space advocates and enthusiasts favoring the investment of public funds in space activities and programs. Uh, political opponents counter that it could be a far cheaper to develop specific technologies directly if they are beneficial and uh, scoff at this justification for pub public expenditures on space related research. And um, I would like to add here the term deep tech is intended to set in aside from its opposite shallow tech. Shallow tech is relatively a simple technological advance moving a business from a non digital, uh, uh, you know, non digital business model to a digital one. Shallow tech advances are easy for competitors to replicate, so don't tend to so they don't tend to disrupt the market so much. For example, a telephone based delivery service uh, now offered in a digital fashion through a phone app or a book a bookshop now offering ebooks for digital download 
uh, would be examples of shallow tech. Uber, while it's disrupted the taxi market uh, completely, doesn't qualify as deep tech uh, because it is leveraged as an uh, already existing concept, uh, you know, like the sharing economy. And it's a built platform using pre-existing, uh, readily available di uh, digital technologies on it. So I think uh, this is my understanding of it. Awesome. Awesome. We need a whole... Um diary to collect all that information but Kartik what's your take on on deep tech space tech or you have any insights you'd like to share with the audience so I look at space tech in three different parlance once is an exploratory space tech is all about trying to gauge utilize and commercially make the universe viable by humans that's that's exactly how space tech is it necessarily works on four different pivots. One is about exploratory space tech, which is what Gene Roddenberry did around 16. Hello? I, I think, think uh, uh, the, <laughs> the connection. I think um, <laughs> yeah, connection issues got um, the better of um, <laughs> Kartik right there. No, yeah. it, it happens to the best of us. No problem. I think we'll it just move on happens. to. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll move on to Hash. Hash, give, give me your um, thoughts, your insights. Uh, I hope the internet will be fair on you today. I mean, better than Kartik. Hopefully, Kartik yeah. To be yeah. Let me in yeah. people. I'm here. I'm here back again. Sorry. He's back. So, oh, awesome. <laughs> I'm talking about space tech being from an exploratory point of view. Space tech from a commercial viability, which is typically your weather and your satcom and your intercountry communication or even your remote sensing for that matter, which is about trying to figure out what happens inside the earth. And a space tech from a defense and an aero point of view, which is trying to gauge life forms on different planets or to gauge commercially viable mineral deposits across, or for example, even space wars and weaponry technology in terms of uh, trying to create opportunities. There is a very strong space exploratory voyage point, voyage business, which has been built which is what Virgin Galactic has been doing over the last few years, trying to take mankind onto different planets. Geographical wars or, or country wars or what, what, or what we call as the race to reach out space is primarily what mass explorations have been or space stations have been, or for that matter, even the SETI project, which was a search for extraterrestrial lifestyle, life that uh, ran for almost nine years across the world, is a prime example of how human beings have been trying to leverage space as a frontier. However, as I always maintained, even in my previous uh, communication, there is a huge difference. Wow. I guess um, we are um, having some hitches with um, Cartex in internet supply. Hash, can you just quickly go into that? Um, um, topic, I mean, insights, deep tech and space tech. Sure. From what I understand, sure. um, let me get your perspective. Sure, sure. So as Karthik was pointing out, right, space tech has multiple uh, avenues to it. It's not just, you know, about simply sending rockets to it. That's just kind of like one part to it, right? So uh, the first one is obviously what uh, uh, Elon Musk is doing, which is sending huge rockets into the sky, deploying satellites, deploying other space products and kind of facilitating, you know, exchange between the astronauts over there who are there in the space station and bringing them back and vice versa, right? That's the first end to it. Additionally, there's a lot of software element to it as well, kind of facilitate communication uh, communication channels between the startups over there as well as in India. Uh, India, and not just India, but across the world. Uh, then there is a, a, a opportunity with what Virgin Galactic is doing, right? They're actually considering having, you know, creating future colonies uh, of Earth-resident planets. 
different uh, different uh, planetary systems and creating a civilization over there so that is kind of like another aspect to it then there's a lot of hardware element to it to kind of ensure primarily into hardware uh, materials uh, basically physical uh, to ensure that you know our physically the materials which are there which are being sent to the space they kind of sustain that right so it's a whole gamut of technologies whole gamut of hardware software and multiple other technologies which are involved in the space tech element of it in terms of deep tech if you look at it overall the most basics are obviously one if you look at it ai is there ml is there nlp is there nlu is there so artificial intelligence machine learning uh, natural language processing natural language understanding neural networks these are all come under the overall sub branch of the ai where all of these are structured over that uh, over there uh, the next so that is primarily it requires a huge amount of data set where you know we have like millions of data points are there which we are then kind of you know um, we analyze them we kind of see whether we can identify some patterns and create some efficiencies out of that create creating better data structures etc that is how ai is kind of focusing on uh, another parallel development has been in the blockchain space that blockchain is used primarily for data retrieval and data security systems it creates a whole new um, secure a whole new aspect in the security element of it right typically if you look at it uh, most security has been you know centralized in a single place blockchain completely decentralizes it and gives us a lot of flexibility a lot of opportunity at the same time blockchain uh, if it in the current state right now it has a lot of limitations in terms of the speed and the access of the technology the way that the technology is structured right now right so i'm kind of ho- hoping in the next 2 3 years to see kind of like a web 2.0 movement right in around uh, just before the end of uh, 1990s uh, there was a, a pivotal moment in the internet history where you had web 2.0 coming and the web 2.0 kind of completely changed how internet was right prior to that you look at the older websites how amazon used to look back in 1995 in the early days they used to be very html based very old school very preliminary website and technology was very poor and then came this web web 2.0 which completely changed everything and it was a real uh, real uh, innovation in terms of how we are seeing websites today right that we i'm kind of expecting to see a similar pivot happening in the blockchain space as well which will make blockchain which is currently not being used as aggressively as it could have based on the potential it has once we have that blockchain 2.0 moment then we will definitely see a lot of movement happening over there awesome thank you from your perspective there is going to be a lot of technology integration and interchange into um, deep tech and space tech environment that would foster um, advancement katik sorry if about your connection um, maybe you just want to round up what you were saying before you yeah. went so i had almost covered the space tech part of it and i was i was talking about space tech not being a place for small businesses primarily it's either a government to government government investment where you're necessarily talking about exploring civilizations or creating technology that helps you weather forecasting but deep tech is where there's a lot of advancement in terms of taking a quantum leap in terms of life cycle or in terms of technology uh, uh, technologies generation the generation of technology as harsh uh, and vandana spoke about primarily in the artificial intelligence and in augmented reality or even blockchain a lot of developments also being ha- also happening in the quantum computing space a lot of developments happening in the robotic space which is what is helping leapfrog the entire warehouse supply chain as well as the medical industry the assembly line and manufacturing industry but most importantly one of the biggest deep tech beneficiaries is environment and defense moving all the way from uh, ground support ground weaponry all the way into deep space weaponry into laser into phasers and now moving into a uh, unmanned aerial vehicles which can uh, manage or uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles which manage distances of more than 14 to 15000 kilometers which is typically half the earth's radius or getting into a clean earth uh, bio biodegradable ge- or a genetically rebuilt environment is where the life is life is moving technology which necessarily impacts life not directly in an end user but creates a better way of living is where there's a lot of investments happening specifically in the part of the world that i am in investments in desalination investments in robotics investments in uh, health based deep tech uh, businesses is what i see very very regular a lot of investments by governments of saudi governments of kuwait government of iran uh, has happened in the deep space and that's uh, space tech but it's primarily supported by government so i don't see startups being present in in this part of the world yeah very very interesting because i was about to say um if um, any startup was out there going to look for pitching or investment opportunities they should reach out startups in space tech would come in into sectors which build space tech 
So the moment you talk of a space tech, you don't necessarily start looking at the universe you, or, or, or the dark sky around. You start by looking at something as basic as your oxygen masks. You start looking as the, as the space suit that takes you into. You start looking at the hydrogen fuel that takes you. You look into the propeller technology that builds your crafts. You look at the life support system inside the entire spacecraft or you even try to try and looking at the rover or the crafts that go into the third generation space and look for some or the remote sensing or the weather forecasting all these semiconductor superconductor and chip based technology is what comes from different ancillary industries that support and the government is a net buyer and then a net executioner of these technologies or of these projects the government invests purely from a from an infrastructure and a management or a BOT point of view, not into a production or not into development of these technologies. So there's always going to be space for startups or for second generation manufacturers in the ancillary space. But in terms of executing and managing a space program, at least apart from Virgin Galactic, I haven't seen even a lot of private players in this space for that matter. It's a very restrictive. Uh, very restricted space. I would be happy if private players were to come in and I, I, I wouldn't know of much. But uh, I'm sure that's that's going to take in a lot of uh, investments. Yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. surely. So uh, to actually to okay. adding to Karthik's uh, to adding to Karthik's point, right? Uh, there are actually he's quite right. Uh, the kind of uh, investment is required upfront to kind of you know build the satellite programs and the rocket uh, deployment system. That is extremely high. So that's why what is happening. Actually, had one startup. Actually, kind of you know starting to operate into that space additionally there are one or two startups in australia and in usa who are starting to you know uh, get into that mode right now uh, they've kind of raised like an um, initial seed funding of five to ten million dollars just to get the product out, out of the system right because without that kind of an investment it becomes extremely difficult so you look at the background of some of these people uh, they are like former nasa or you know uh, former uh, space they work for the respective country space departments uh, extremely material uh, focus on you know material engineering and material science and these kind of uh, uh, experts product experts are kind of coming together and they are trying to create you know a whole small subset and creating a whole series of uh, startups primarily into the startup space you know so not just for the auxiliary technology but even the primary space technology where you actually uh, deploy rockets into the outer space but it's still quite difficult because it requires 5 to 10 million dollars just to get out the ground without that is extremely difficult I, I agree with you, Harsh. Um, Karthik wanted to say something, I guess. Well, I, was, I, I, was, I was going to give you a corollary. There was a program last year or the year before, which was primarily about launching something similar to the K-11 weather, weather services and K-12 uh, surveillance services by one of the country's governments here. It had to actually go for a foreign borrowing from the GCC fund so as to ensure that that weather and surveillance technology could be deployed. It typically costs anything in the region of 11 to 12 billion to get the entire solution. The only way where a small startup would come in is in terms of analyzing the data that comes in, building radio imaging or imaging technology that allows to decode what information comes in, or for, for, for that matter, even creating small launch vehicles which would carry the payload. Even that is where investments in government support is required. So I, I, I completely believe in the fact that while this is a growing sector, there is a lot of unexplored uh, geography and unexplored universe. I'm sure this is still going to be a lot of uh, government to government or space administration funding. Telescope is something that is being built or very, very strongly built. Environment friendly space technology is something that is built. Space cleaning projects are getting done. Space ports are something that is being developed. But I haven't seen startups in this space. At least I don't recall seeing any. You are, you are quite right, Kartik. And um, I, I, a while back, I did some study and research. And um, I found out that the, um, the company that actually started vertical takeoff and landing that um, Elon Musk is using currently in SpaceX was started by a small company, very small company. But they are so small that they could never get funding to go beyond just the engineering of such systems. And somehow um, Elon Musk got in touch with them, maybe borrowed a bit from their technology and took it to the next level. You know, so it's like you said, it's not a um, it's not a, an industry for small players. It has to come with big players exactly, with big money. Exactly what nuclear technology has been a restricted space and requires massive investments. 
is or even earth exploration for that matter oil drilling is also a technology and a space that is restricted for either government to government or large corporations there is this this is i wouldn't say captive but this is a restricted space for the time being at least no no that, that well that's interesting but nonetheless there are professionals out there and there are researchers mm -hmm. out there that can still play an active role in um developing technologies testing out hypotheses that will be relevant in this industry so they need to get busy they need to get researching and they need to get exposure and um but, but one thing i'd like to understand um there's a lot of talk about space space deep tech and all that vandana what do you think um what potential do you think there is in this sector and why do you think that is the is the next big thing? I mean, of course, in the past few years, we've seen more space explorations than the previous decades. Why do you think this sector has potential, and why will it bloom? What are we looking for? Example, what are we looking for so much in space that we cannot find on Earth? Okay, so um, I'll touch the deep tech first. Uh, so India's, uh, should I talk about deep tech or space tech first? No, please, please do talk about both, but maybe start okay. with deep tech. Yeah. All right. So India's deep tech ecosystem has been developing for the last five to seven years. Entrepreneurs are building new business models using technologies such as artificial intelligence and machine learning. However, small and mid-sized businesses are still having a limited appetite to pay for the software. So uh, deep tech at a high level refers to uh, a technology and innovation that has potential to disrupt and transform the world and has a deep impact on the society. In the context of uh, you know, software or hardware, entrepreneurs are building new business models using recent technologies, advances in areas such as artificial inten intelligence, machine learning, uh, big data, you know, uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, blockchain industry, robotics, cybersecurity, Internet of Things, and others. When utilized optimally, these technologies uh, and the associated IPs can create significant entry barriers for any startup, uh, you know, giving them an edge over competition. For example, finding a cure to disease, IoT sensors with analytics to increase the yield in agriculture, making smarter credit decisions in finance or developing clean energy solutions are some of the areas that deep tech is uh, finding real world applications. So uh, I feel uh, deep tech is definitely has the potential here. And uh, uh, as far as space tech is concerned, I mean, uh, you know, uh, investors, uh, you know, we haven't seen much investments happening in space tech in India or uh, you know around the world it's definitely we need to explore uh, more how to take this forward so uh, you know i feel uh, you know in the space tech we still need to have a lot of uh, uh, you know maybe we need to study it deeply and see where we can uh, uh, you know uh, take this forward but uh, 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 one thing is there, COVID-19 has, uh, you know, led to significant momentum in the deep tech as well as the space tech with the interest from VC firms and funding agencies in the uh, deep tech startups. 14% uh, of the total investments uh, in 2020 were in deep tech startups and, uh, uh, you know, in uh, 11% in 2000, wherein 11% was there only in 2019. Further, in 87% of the deep tech investments were in AI and ML startups in 2020. So, um, you know, in terms of space tech, I think we still have to uh, see, though uh, we have some uh, Indian startups that are looking towards uh, working to, uh, in this space. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you very much, Bandana. Because um, from what I get to understand, um, deep tech is uh, getting increasingly popular because it has the potential to disrupt and yeah. to um, 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 positively impact um, health tech, agri tech, and all sorts. 
I dare say that um, deep tech is partly responsible for the accelerated pace at which we the vaccines for COVID-19 was um, realized. And right. such investment in deep tech could find probably more vaccines for HIV, for cancer, and for the major ailments out right. there. Right. Yeah, so yeah. Um, I, I, I strongly concur with your own um, 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 potential, your view of your potential of um, deep tech. But Kati, yeah. do you share that opinion? I agree on the deep tech part. I think, and I would, I would, I would have my own stipulations on space tech. So I think uh, with 8 billion people living on this planet and consuming that much food and water every year, at some point the planet's going to be very, very restrictive. It won't have enough space for everybody. And the very nature of mankind is an imperialistic conquestator, which means it would want to broaden its horizons. For years it's been trying to do. We have been trying to explore civilizations, not just to explore and know them, but at some point to either take them over, find aliens, find not aliens, find life forms like us, or life forms that we can relate to and create colonies. What Interstellar did four or five years ago in the movie is what a reality is going to be in a few years, where we won't have enough food for people living on this planet. Maybe we, we risk the entire human race by being settled on one planet and asteroid, an asteroid can knock the entire civilization out of its orbit, which is where to de-risk at some point human beings would want to start. Even country or geographical supremacy would take human beings to space at some point. What Russia and the US have been doing for the last 40 years is creating a web of satellites. Today, more than 12,000 satellites rotate or revolve when move circle around the Earth in different orbits. Now that creates an entire web, which is typically giving you a distance of just about three to four kilometers between each satellite. So you would at some point start seeing space traffic jams as well. You might see space traffic signals in space. We've already reached there. It's just that a, that a lot of us don't even know about what kind of projects move or what kind of projects get into the execution mode. When we've decoded the Milky Way and when we've decoded four galaxies around us and we are trying to look for life forms that are typically in the 300 light years radius around the Earth, it's, it's not just to keep our uh, inflated egos excited. It's about desperately trying to look for landing ports where human beings can be re-established and settled. At some point, we would need to do that. Virgin Galactic's uh, efforts or the space space station's efforts, Discovery's efforts, are not to create a uh, massive infrastructure or massive investment uh, in the space. It's about trying to create alternate space, alternate home for human beings. So space tech is only it is always going to be further explored, and it, it's it's going it it has it has a boundaryless exploration. So there's no limit to it. Deep tech primarily is about trying to make our life easier. Our wants and our needs and our way of living is always so complex that it continuously evolves. We could live without certain technology in the past, but the latency of technology has challenged us so much that we want things to be faster, better, easier, cheaper, and still more, uh, and still more productive in life, which is where robotics, which is where artificial intelligence, which is where augmented reality, which is where health tech, and which is where green tech comes in. All the way from sustainability to productivity, deep tech has played a very important role in our life and it would continue to do so. Yeah. Awesome. That's that. Awesome. Right, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, I mean, I was trying to process all that you said, but one thing stood out. Uh, recently, obviously, the, um, the Mars rover landed in Mars. And I'm wondering, what do you think they will find? They would find three things. They would find soil that is similar to us. They might find human beings. They might not. They might find a lot of uh, debris from other explorations. They would find a possibility of life that can coexist or possibility of creating life. It's not about finding life there. It's about trying to create an atmosphere or trying to create an ecosystem that would allow life, allow life to thrive. And that's what our mass our media has been showing us in the last 60 years all the way from Total Recall, where you try to create life pods into different civilizations or into different planets, which can thrive in different temperatures, to gravity, where you try and get into a space mission, to an interstellar, to into geostorms. You're trying to create a life beyond Earth, and that is what everybody has been exploring. So yes, Rover would find something different, but what Rover finds is not important. What we can do with what Rover finds is more important. Awesome.
Awesome. Thank you very much, Kartik. I mean, you just threw me back to those days where I used to read the books and watch the movies, space tech, uh, light travel and all that. I mean, Hash, what do you have to say? I mean, do you share similar optimism about the potential in space tech and deep tech? No, so uh, definitely the space uh, definitely has a lot of potential. And currently, the way that the current, uh, you know, the green uh, problem that we have, the way we are polluting the environment, etc., it's become extremely necessary that we actually go out uh, and explore other potential areas where we can live, right? We've seen movies like, as Karthik was mentioning, Interstellar, right? In the past, historically, we have we most of the movies like Armageddon, we show alien aliens coming to Earth and invading us. This time, we are trying to do the reverse of it, where we are trying to go to other colonies and try to establish shop over there. So it's kind of like a huge uh, anti-climax of the way that we've been kind of brought up in the way that we've been seeing things, right? So space is definitely a lot of interesting, uh, interesting scenario over there. But if you get into the deep tech element of it, we've talked about AI, we've talked about NLP, we've talked about blockchain and all that stuff, right? I would like to uh, talk about a more deeper medical tech in terms of stem cell research, uh, molecular biology and genomics research, the kind of advancements which are happening over there, right? They are ridiculously deep tech in terms of the kind of research that is being done in terms of the knowledge which is being grown on a regular basis, right? We tend to kind of, you know, when we talk about deep tech, we always tend to focus on AI and NLP and the typical uh, digital technologies out there. But these kind of technologies, which are still in the hindsight, the amount of potential which they have, it's absolutely brilliant, right? Uh, just look, uh, I'm actually in touch with two medical device startups helping them raise funds. Uh, the kind of uh, stem cell research that they are doing uh, using placenta-based and plasma-based therapies for, you know, faster healing of uh, patients, etc., it's absolutely amazing the kind of de developments which are happening. And that is uh, one of the ma ma major areas where I see a lot of investments happening in medical tech, etc. Uh, and then you also see a convergence between the medical tech side of it and AI side of it. How you can use AI to kind of hasten the medical technology development, right? The most obvious one being we, we can have like a faster uh, research on the pharmaceutical drugs, faster research on the vaccine, etc. Also in, in the genet genomics and the genetic side over there as well, where we can have a faster process where we understand how the stem cells are reacting to the new tissues, whether they are accepting it, whether they are rejecting it, and the, pot the possibilities and the potentials of synergy between two of these technologies is absolutely endless. And it's really incredible, you know, if you kind of merge these two technologies in a way where it, uh, you know, uh, the development of these new products becomes a lot more faster. Currently, it takes like two to three years to develop the products followed by two to three years of clinical trials. Imagine a time when we can merge these technologies and have these products into the market within one or two years at best. Awesome. I mean, I, I just wanted to ask one question. Nanotechnology, would that fall into deep tech? Absolutely. Nanotechnology absolutely falls into deep tech and it has uh, multiple sides of it, right? Nanotechnology is being used in material science where you use it for plastic coatings, in, glee, in uh, clean and green energy as well to kind of ensure, you know, the materials are being structured in a way that the heat that is being created, right, it doesn't kind of give out extra heat. If you have the conventional cement concrete, it gives off a lot of heat. It keeps the heat, you know, retained over here. They're coming up with new nanotech materials, which ensures that the energy uh, is there, which is being bounced back. It bounces back all together and doesn't stay over there. And that's why it doesn't make the temperature hotter, right? So that is a part of nanotech in the material science space. Then you have nanotech in into healthcare space as well where we have pharmaceutical drug delivery systems, where they're using those uh, nanotechnology products to kind of, you know, ensure that they are delivered much more easily. Then you have gene splicing and other therapies that doesn't qualify into nanotech, but it's extremely micro over there as well, where they can actually independently slice a gene uh, in the DNA for person. So this is extremely deep tech, which is being involved. It's not a conventional digital technology, but it definitely qualifies as a deep tech technology. Awesome. I guess that the, the, the entire space and um, deep tech is so wide that I think deep tech is the future. I mean, deep tech is the basis of the future. And a lot of things that are going forward will be centered around deep tech. And I want to go back to Vandani that um, what are the tips? How, to, how, to, how do you um, recognize um, good space for deep tech companies? What are the traits that you identify as an investor in deep space and deep tech companies what are those things that you see and then you know oh this company or this project has potential 
maybe our audience will be interested in knowing this so they can align themselves. Right, right. So uh, right now, for example, machine intelligence, IoT, decentralization, blockchain and crypto and alternative realities are at or approaching market readiness at various le levels of maturity. We regularly see companies and products uh, using them for practical purposes, and we have been involved in creating several innovative pioneering deep tech ventures for corporate partners during 2019. If a technology is immature, then it doesn't make sense to look for opportunities with marketplaces or business operating models. Uh, instead, entrepreneurs should be looking for opportunities to develop the raw technology first. Then as uh, use cases emerge to use the new technology at scale, entrepreneurs should look for infrastructure plays. When the infrastructure for large scale deployment is in place, entrepreneurs can look for marketplace operating model and new aggregation uh, you know, opportunities. So when a new technology arrives, opportunities emerge for new types of startups and new businesses whose primary opportunity area is to uh, uh, innovative with or on top of new technology itself. Uh, once uh, businesses begin to exploit the technology, opportunities emerge for new types of infrastructure to support these new technologies and interactions between users at scale. Uh, once a new infrastructure allows new technology to operate at scale, new types of marketplaces and business operating model emerge to facilitate interaction between producers and consumers for, uh, uh, you know, of the new technology. Uh, finally, once the uh, tech infrastructure and operating models uh, bed down, opportunities emerge for new types of aggregation and disaggregation to occur occur on the top of the new technology stack. For example, consider the example of ride sharing. It emerged out of the uh, confluence of a number of different technologies. Some new, some old, 3G and 4G, uh, GPS, touch screens, uh, CPU power optimization, and a revolution in the user experience. These elements then combine to enable the modern smartphone. Uh, you know, as soon as the utility of a smartphone type device like the original iPhone became an apparent uh, users flock to, uh, you know, how it changed the entire market, you must be aware of that. So, uh, you know, what I'm trying to say is users flock to own, uh, you know, one telecos took this as a clear signal to invest in supporting infrastructure. So I think uh, smartphone app stores launched uh, solving the problems of mass distribution of apps to end users and thereby unlocking new marketplaces and business operating models. So I hope I've clarified this uh, point. Nathan, you Thank you. Me. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Vandani. I mean, there's still a lot to digest when it comes to all of this. And I want to encourage our um, viewers, the audience. I mean, this is an opportunity to go back and watch this um, program all over again. It will be um, permanently on the Latokin page on YouTube. You can t t follow us and, and watch it again on LinkedIn. You can also do similar on, on, on Twitter and on Facebook. The videos will be there live. You can go um, watch the details again, get some topics and insights that you missed the first time. And you can also share the content with your team and, um, and realize what you need to do to take your project to the next level. You know, and I mean, there really is a lot. I don't really know where to um, go, but Kartik, um, I'd, I'd like to go over to you. Now, um, how would you recognize a, a, a project that is worthy of um, um, support, financial support for our audience out there, for the researchers out there, for the intellectuals out there? What are the things that you are looking at as investment worthy in the deep tech and space tech environment? So A, space tech. I might look at a project being investment worthy, but a project might no, not look at me being an investment worthy because I wouldn't have, or none of my family offices would have the money to invest in space tech. They would rather buy me out. So 
So, but if it's a deep tech project, it's the first rider and, and Nathan is about what is the technology going to do? Because technology can do a lot of things. Is it clutter breaking? Is it really two generations, three generations, four generations ahead? For example, if I'm in the space technology, if I'm in the, let's say, drone or a credit or, 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 or for example, even aircraft technology, am I actually doing a four and a half generation or a fifth generation aircraft? Am I developing a sixth generation or a seventh generation aircraft? If I'm in a superconductor uh, business, what chipset am I working on? What speed sets am I working on? So what, what is the technology going to do for me? That's one. Second, more, most importantly, is any tech startup necessarily doesn't have to live in the present. There's always three teams that work on tech startups. One is a team that lives in the present. One team that one is a team that lives in immediate future and a team that lives in remote future, which is where you need to have a very strong roadmap for four to five years. If you do not have a roadmap to, for, for four to five years, your investment is going to become a waste, primarily because you do not have a horizon. Technology obsolescence, even in deep tech for that matter, be it for weaponry or be it for artificial intelligence, is quickly replicated because your codes are out in market. Today, we live in a cloud-based environment. Everything is open. Everything is democratized. So the moment I have a technology available and look at the wars between large weapon manufacturers, the moment Lockheed Martin comes out with something, the Russians and the Chinese copy it. And the moment Russian comes up with something with its T or a Sukhoi platform, Lockheed Martin is quick out for that matter. Even Boeing's are quick, Boeing's quick to develop some of these technologies. So it's about how well equipped are you? What kind of vision do you have? Do you have a pathway? Do you have a story? Do you have sustainability? Do you have a bandwidth and team to develop this? Because you might have team to take the take the project live, but do you have the team to take the project to the end? And who's your end consumer? Is there going to be a substantial demand for the technology that you're developing? Because to, technology is not about today's requirement. Technology is about to, tomorrow's requirement and a lot of latency into it. I, 50 years ago, I did not know I would need robotics, but somebody would have thought that tomorrow's human beings would require robotics. So today, when I see robotics being available to me, it's a wow factor for me. It's an aha effect. So it's about building and knowing latency. Once you have these latencies, once you have competent, a competent team on the, on the table, once you have a vision in terms of technology, milestones and lifestyle is where I would try and spark my dollars. At that point, I would de-risk myself and say, here is a bet. Technology is a 50-50 win game. So if, uh, even after doing all this, there's, also, there's always a 50% chance of it bombing in the market because somebody beats me to it. So whether I've got, get, got my confidentiality right, whether I've got my copyrights and patents right, whether I've got the control samples made to a level where I do my UAT first before somebody even breathes of that technology is the way I would look at it. It's primarily about how organized, structured, visionary, and life oriented the business is. And if it ticks the boxes, I'd be more than happy to invest. Awesome. Awesome, guys. I, I really appreciate your your um your your thoughts and your insights so far. I mean any any um of our viewers, any researcher out there can really get from all that you've said that there is um need to not just look at um, developing a t technology for now but develop it for years to come develop something that would outlive you definitely so your your tech your development or your idea must be futuristic not just um, for today's or next year or next five years you know and i'm sure our audience um, will sit back and realize that this indeed like you said is for the big players and um I, I'm, I'm still waiting for any feedback from the audience, any feedback from uh, viewers, if you have any questions. And guys, as we run up. 60 years ago, Nathan, Gene Roddenberry spoke about two technologies. If you go to the go to the old generation Star Trek, he spoke, he spoke about Beam Me Up Scotty, which is about electron to energy and energy to electron and mass conversions. Today's world is still struggling to make this technology come alive. Technology about phasers, technology about laser-based weaponry, which was spoken in 1950s and 1960s, has become a prima donna in today's world. Electronic, electromagnetic impulse weaponry is undergoing development at this stage. These were technologies that were envisioned typically three generations ago. What napalm bomb used to do in Vietnam in typically 1970s, 1980s was a very crude technology which got built over the Gulf War and it now 
during the Afghanistan war is where it came out in terms of a very, very strong, potent predator or drone based technology. So that is how technology evolves. Even if you look at beyond visible range or if for that matter, even uh, space exploration technology about trying to find civilizations was built through SETI in late 1990s and it has become a reality now, which is where on multiple remote sensing hubs in at least eight to nine different pods across the world is where we are able to hear and capture voice notes or hear and capture sonar notes about life beyond Earth. So it takes that much time for technology to gestate. And, I, and as a business, I wouldn't expect a startup to give me immediate results, especially if it is in deep tech in Internet of Things or in artificial intelligence or, in, or for that matter, even in uh, medical tech. So, yeah, it, it requires a lot of gestation period, it requires deep pockets and it requires patience for maturity of technology. Thank you very much, Kartik. So much to learn. Obviously, 60 minutes or 50 minutes cannot do justice to all we have to discuss. But what are your parting shots, Kartik, as we come to the end of today's show? I mean, your final think, words uh, to the audience. I think it is uh, an exciting space to be, and space tech is a green. I mean, it's a green shoot. It's it's a it's a it's a sunrise industry. A lot of government support, a lot of infrastructure democratization, and there is a, there is a room for everybody to grow. Deep tech. If you have a vision, if you have a plan, and if you have a solution to some of the challenges that we face in today's world, there would be a lot of large businesses that would be very happy to invest in in these startups, including us. Obviously, obviously. Guys, look out, you know, something to invest and um, research into. Vandani, I mean, you said a lot. You've given us a lot of statistics. Give us your final thoughts about um, deep tech, space tech. Yeah. So, uh, you know, Nathan, investors can also be incentivized by the desire to make an impact on the future. I mean, if you look at it, deep tech by nature is futuristic. Uh, this incentivizes investors to look into deep tech to be able to have a considerable impact on the future. So I feel additionally, the products in deep tech industry are scarce, meaning they have the possibility of gaining more market share and revenue than other kinds of products. Ultimately, the combination uh, of a possible return and the chance to make a difference, uh, you know, drives investors to put their arms into deep tech. So I think uh, this is what I feel about uh, deep tech. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you very much, Fantani. Um, like I told um, the audience earlier, this is an opportunity to go back and watch this program all again. You know, there's so much to learn, so many questions to ask. And indeed, if you do have questions, post them on the comment section. Somehow we'll get to um, give feedback. And guess what? Our panelists are available to connect with on LinkedIn. You can connect with them. Um, Kartik is on LinkedIn. Vandana is on LinkedIn. Go ahead, you know, get in touch with them and, um, you know, share whatever thoughts you have with them. Awesome opportunity. Guys, I know Hash had to disappear for a bit there, but we understand. Thank you, Hash, for being part of today's show. Thank you for Danny. Thank you, Kartik. I really do hope to have another show with you, another exciting topic. Kartik, bye-bye. Thank Vandana. you so much. Bye-bye.